Tonight we begin the third chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 29th lesson. There's an extra handout in the lessons you received tonight. Just for your information and reverence. We'll talk some about Paul and his teaching. This is uh, on that list of 70-some things that only Paul taught. Since I had it, I thought I'd just we'll share that with people. It's a good little thing to know because there's not many people that know this. Or they have thought about it. Everybody say it that way. Not many people have thought about this. How many things he said that if he hadn't have said them, you wouldn't have heard anything about them. And as you can see, it's, it's quite a bit. <laughs> In fact, it's actually point by point most of what you know. Most of what you know about newness of life you got from Paul. Amen. There's others. He's not the only one, but by far, <laughs> percentile-wise, it's uh, most... Now, Paul, he's laboring to his, he's not trying to convert the Ephesian brethren. They've already been converted. He's laboring to establish them. And he's going to do it by confirming that the gospel they heard from the beginning contained all the power and all the ingredients necessary to perfect the people of God. Now, they're like a nut that has to be cracked and opened up. Yeah. That, that's how the gospel is. Yeah. Just the gospel of itself, just like a walnut, there it is. You can bean someone in the head with it and make some impressions. Uh -huh. <laughs> but so many people, they just, they don't know anything about the gospel. They think the gospel is just to convert sinners and that's pretty much it, but that's not pretty much it. It's the power of God unto salvation. That's, that's saying something. Amen. See, you need the power not only to receive Christ, but to keep him. Yeah. You need the power not only to obtain faith, but to maintain faith Amen. and keep the faith. And that's the technicality that's overlooked in our generation. In fact, some people have concocted theologies that say, well, you don't have to worry once you're in, Jesus locks the door. That's it. You can't get out. <laughs> My goodness, what are you going to tell Adam and Eve? They got in, and God kicked them out. Amen. Hmm? What do you do with people like that? Judas got in, and Judas fell out. Amen. Israel got into Canaan, and God booted them out. Amen. See, so this is just empty-headed theology. But still, this mindset... It's been formalized in our days. It's been formalized and books have been written about it and creeds have been written about it and it's been, it's been stereotyped. It hadn't been in Paul's day. It was kind of loose, kind of loose thinking, but the, but the reality of it still existed and he knew that if men and women aren't established in the Lord, they are going to drift away, period. Amen. They're like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. If you don't go on to perfection, you will fall away. Yeah. Yes. Amen. There is no static position in Christ. You just mm -hmm. stick like a stick in the mud, you stay there. And the, there's no position like that. Right. This is a progressive. You enter in the kingdom at the edge of the board promised land. You enter in and all your life you're progressing. Mm -hmm. Now that takes establishment to do that. Establishment, and that's what... He's doing, he's going to particularly establish that it's the powers resident in the gospel. That's the means God used, used to get to choose us and call us. The other writers, James and Jude, John and Peter, they also knew that. They just didn't say as much about it as Paul did. Oh, they, they yeah. just hinted at it. None of them, Jude and James didn't add one new thing. They didn't add one new thought. Luke didn't either. Peter, he provided some insights. 
but it's not to be compared. See, God has revealed infinitely more to the Gentiles than he ever did to the Jews. Even though if you take your Bible, two-thirds of your Bible was written to the Jews. But there's more in this one-third than is ever conceived in his two-thirds. Wouldn't it be proper to say he's revealed more to his church than to the Jews? Well, I'm saying to the Jews because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. It's been revealed for everybody, but the apostle of the Gentiles is the one who did the most of it. And there's, go ahead, Brother Tony. Interrupt, you go ahead. There's, there's a logic to it is that the Gentiles were last, but when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, they were, in the volume, they were first. The, that doesn't mean this is left out to the Jews, but they're going to come in later after they've been provoked to jealousy yes. by the Gentiles. Good, Brother Tony. That, that Paul brushed his feet off in that in, there when he got upset with the yeah. Jews, and that's when he was able to really pour these things out mm -hmm. to right. people that wanted to hear them. They <laughs> yeah. came the next day, the yeah. whole city, and they wanted to hear what Paul was preaching. Gentiles did want to hear what Paul was preaching. Now, when you get up, you get up high enough. Now you have to get up high to see this. I mean, I admit, <laughs> I admit that you can't fly in the low zone and see this. But if you get up here high enough, God said He poured out the Spirit of deep sleep on the Jews. He put them to sleep so they couldn't see. But God wasn't about to put His plan on hold, so He dumps the thing out to the Gentiles. That's what happened. So that that would be provoked the Jews, so they could come in and we'd all be, all be one. Because the unity is based on insight. The unity of the faith he's talking about is based on insight. So you can't be united to another believer beyond what you can see with your heart, with your faith. You got a little bitty small faith. You just fellowship with kindergarten Christians. That's just. That's the way it is. You're around the others, and pretty soon you've got to grow up and get off the baby food, so to speak. Now, to show you that God has designed that a message is what's going to save the people. A message, a message is what's going to save the people. Not how good you are, not how kind you are, not how friendly you are. It's a message that's going to do it. Now, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 1.21, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching there is not a verb. It's a noun. Preaching. It's used in the same sense that God used to Jonah when he said to Jonah in Jonah 3.2, preach, preach unto it the preaching. Preach the preaching. That I bid it. It's a message, in other words. Yeah. It's a thing preached. Yeah. So it pleased God to save by the foolishness of a message preached. Mm -hmm. To save them, not save them that don't believe. Mm -hmm. Like initially coming in. You've been in for 50 years. It's still this way. Yeah. You're yeah. saved by a message. Yeah. Yeah. The message of the gospel. And what Paul's doing, he's dissecting the the gospel getting down into it, see. So from the beginning of the church now, it's been difficult for men to see this. From day one. There weren't many churches that did see it. Church at Corinth was a rather large assembly. They didn't see it. They chose to follow another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. So Paul, he didn't talk much about the things he's talked about in Ephesians. He didn't tell any of these things to the Corinthians. It wasn't because he didn't want to tell them. Because they were at a level where it would just went over there. It's like Jesus said, I've got a lot of things to tell you, but you're not ready. You're not ready yet. Or Paul said to the Hebrews, I have many things to say about Melchizedek, but... I get upset with those Hebrews. Why, what, what they drag their feet like that, and now we had a way to glory to find out more about Melchizedek. They've just been on the ball a little more. More could be said. See? 
it does make a difference how far along you are. Amen. Now, some people make, they advance pretty well, but they're not in an environment where anyone above average speaks to them. That's just kind of a tragedy to be in. So, proportionally speaking, very few professing believers have an acceptable view of the gospel. You ask the average Bible student, what's the gospel? They'll tell you well, the gospel is the death. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. That's what it says the gospel is. But that's just the outline of the gospel. That's not the whole of it. Or if you were thinking about it as a structure, that's just the framework of the gospel. It's not the whole whole house. So what the apostles did, and particularly Paul in the apostles' doctrine, they opened up the gospel. The gospel included you receiving the spirit. The gospel included you receiving eternal life. The gospel included Jesus being an intercessor and a mediator and a shepherd and a guide and a captain of your salvation. It included telling you're being brought to glory, that God, Jesus, can be touched the feeling of your infirmities. It's, it's a whole host of things that's contained in the gospel. So he's grounding the Ephesians, uh, Paul is grounding the Ephesians in this. Now this kind of preaching, of course, is radically different from the preaching of the contemporary church at large. They are exceptions, but they are exceptions. All right, our text for tonight is third, third chapter, verses 1 and 2. For this cause... <coughs> I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, to you word. For this cause, in other words, say for this reason, or it's in consequence of this, so it's something he said before modifies this on this account or because of this when I think of all this and this is why Paul will not explain why he's in his present circumstance which was confusing to a lot of a lot of people you remember the last verse of the second chapter in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. All right, that's the, that's the thought now. He's building on that thought now. For this is called the church. The church is a habitation, is built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now for this cause. For this, because the church is mainly for God. Right? Amen. The church isn't mainly for people. The church is mainly for God. The church certainly isn't a hospital for the sick. It's a habitation for God. That's what it says. Amen. First Corinthians 3 says it's God's temple. Ye, plural, are God's temple. The church is a place where God is, where he dwells. He does it through the spirit now. In the world to come, God himself will be with us. Amen. If you want to find God, if a person wants to find God in this world, they've got to come in contact with somebody who's in his church. Amen. They're not going to find him some other way. That's how it's going to happen. We know this is the case because Paul said that Paul, Cephas, Apollos, some of the Corinthians were following. They formed denominations already. They were, some were Cephasites, some were Apollosites, and some were Paulites. At least they just had three. And 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, he says, who are? <laughs> who are Paul, Apollos, Cephas? Who are they? Apollos. They're ministers whom God has given, by ministers by whom you believed, whom God has given to every man. So everybody's had a minister. Amen. Nobody read theirself into Jesus. 
not even if they read the Bible. They had to come in contact, just like that eunuch. He could have read the Bible all the way to Ethiopia. And he still wouldn't have known what Isaiah 53 meant. God had to send a man there that was on the inside. This is how the kingdom set up. People are saved by the preaching of the gospel, and only the folk on the inside have an insight into that gospel. So you've got to come in contact with somebody that knows about it. And God's in control of the contacts. <laughs> Here's a man, a Cornelius. He's a centurion. He's over, in, he's over in Caesarea, long haul from Jerusalem. <laughs> But God knows about this man. He dispatches a man to go down there to clear things up for him. Same happened to Samaria. God dispatches Philip to go down there. Same in Macedonia. God dispatches Paul and his company to go over there and clear things up. He sent him a minister, see? So in your life, there's some, some point where you had a minister not minister as in capital M. Minister is someone God sent who could open the thing up and put it with it and put it within your reach, you might say. Now Paul's going to explain why he's in his present circumstance in view of the fact that he made the habitation of the, the church a habitation for God. How do you explain one of the key builders being in jail? I mean this doesn't make sense. If the if God's building up the church and Paul's a master builder, what, what is he doing in jail? That doesn't make sense. He's going to explain why. I, Paul. Now, why does he draw attention to himself? Why doesn't he say, now, it wasn't me? Maybe you've heard people say this. It wasn't. You'd say, thank you very much. That was a good message. And they'll say, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. Well, that's not exactly true. That's just that you're, you, you're humbling yourself too low. I, Paul. He does this because there was a single thing he was really known for. I, Paul. You hear Paul, there's just some certain things you think about. You don't think about, he was a tent maker. He was a tent maker, but that's not, that's not what he was noted for, tent making. There probably were some Christians that came to him and said, could you make us a tent? I mean, when we moved to Joppa, and I, because I do computing technology, I had all kinds of people say, would you come and help us with the computer? He says, man, I didn't come here to, I retired from that kind of stuff. I didn't come here to carry on a trade and make one-tenth of the income I was making back then. Does that make sense? If I wanted to do that kind of work, I'd stay there and still be in the six figures instead of trying to grub around here at Walmart all the time. So no, I'm not here to do that kind of thing for you. If I mean, there have been people I did it for because I loved them, you know, but I wouldn't be, adult, I wouldn't be surprised if some people... He asked Paul to make some tents. Well, I'm pointing out, he pointed, he drew attention to himself because he had a reputation. He also, he worked with his hands to support some, the people who were with him. But it would be out of order to say, I like to travel with Paul because I understand he, he pays the way. I understand he works and he supports the people journeying with him, so I think I'd like to work with Paul. That's not what he was noted for. When you heard of Paul, you didn't think of his education. Someone said, Paul was extensively educated. Hogwash. Who said he was? His education was a Jewish education. He was raised up at the feet of Gamaliel, not at the University of Tarsus. You probably heard people say that. He went out of way to tell you where he got his education. He got his education to feed the Gamaliel, who wasn't like Socrates. He was a Jewish scholar in scriptures. So you, did, you didn't think of, uh, here Paul, you don't think of his craft, you don't think of his education. 
You don't think of his willingness to work. You thought invariably of what he preached because that's what he's known for. He's known for what he preached. Amen. I, Paul, the Paul you've heard about that preaches. See, there's a tendency in men to major on Marnie minors and seek benefits from other things. I might say, you know, Brother Blowhard went to Harvard. Oh, boy, he, oh, I really went on to listen to him. Went to Harvard, you say, oh, yeah. And after he went to Harvard, he went to the Dallas Theological Seminary. Oh, he must know a lot. Not even Jesus could make claims like that. If people tend to do this, that's what it doesn't say. I, Paul, who was. I, Paul, who am. I, Paul. You've heard about me already. Many, the saint of God, has not had the truth burning in his heart and a fervent desire to make it known. Paul did. He was noted for this. Not only did he know a lot, he said a lot. Now I've heard people with extensive education that talk like they went only through third grade. Maybe you have too. What they learned that was so profound, they didn't talk about. Paul did. Paul talked about what he knew. I, Paul, that's the one. The prisoner of Jesus Christ that's at the time of writing. He's in jail at the time of writing. The prisoner of Jesus Christ. <coughs> the other versions say, Christ Jesus made me his prisoner. And another, the message says, I'm in jail for Christ. The prisoner of Jesus, didn't say the prisoner of Rome. That's not. That's not what he said. <laughs> Prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now does the text mean that Paul was in prison because of his stand for Christ? Or does it mean that Christ put him in prison? It's the latter. Paul is not a prisoner of Rome, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Jesus sent him to jail. He was really in the grip of the Son of God, and he knew it. The steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord, even when they go to jail. <laughs> There's a game we used to play, and there was a, one part of it said, go to jail. All right, this was a section in Paul's life when Jesus said, go to jail. Now, it's possible that some of the Ephesians might have taken personal responsibility for him being in jail. Because he was originally arrested, which ended up in him being in jail because some of the Asian Jews thought he'd brought Trophimus, who was from Ephesus, into the temple, and that kind of started this whole process that ended up him in jail. So it's, it's possible some of the Ephesians might have taken that personally and thought, well, if it's our fault that he's in jail. Well, he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Let's look at it from heaven's point of view now first. Paul's imprisonment provided him time to write to the churches. <laughs> and supply a rich resource that the body of Christ would have throughout subsequent history. Amen. These letters weren't written on the fly. Uh -huh. yeah. From the devil's point of view, this was a time when the old serpent sought to stop the preaching of the gospel. But instead of stopping it, it proliferated. <laughs> Praise God. And from the church's point of view, it was a time when Paul developed a profound care for the churches, wrote epistles to them. Now, we have a similar 
occasion in the imprisonment of John, the, uh, the beloved apostle. He was exiled to Patmos by Diocletian, I believe. But he says, I was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is, God sent me to Patmos so I could get this private revelation without any kind of interruption. He had the same, same situation Paul had. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. <laughs> See how all things work together for good to them that love God? You probably have experienced some hardships in your life. They were hard to be born. I passed through some myself. But as I look at retrospect, God was like positioning me, yeah. teaching me how to trust, mm -hmm. teaching me how he can speak to you when there's nobody else apparently that will speak to you. See, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. But it's, it's for you Gentiles. I, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. I say for you Gentiles. <coughs> Some versions read for the sake of the Gentiles. That's the Revised Standard. Good news for those who are not Jewish. For the benefit of you Gentiles. Oh, now we're getting to it. One version wholly misrepresents the verse by saying that Paul had been preaching the acceptance of the Gentiles, and that's why he went to jail. This is the Living Bible. I am here in jail because of you, for the preaching that you Gentiles are a part of God's house. That's why I went to jail. Well, actually, he didn't say they, were, they didn't learn they were part of God's house until after he went to jail. How, how does... How does the author of the Living Bible figure that one out? There are several letters known to have been written to the churches while Paul was in prison. <clears throat> Some of the primary ones are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. I gave you the text where he refers to himself as a prisoner at the time of writing. Now, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are especially rich in doctrine that you can't really get any place else. <laughs> you can't get it any place else. Like he talks in Ephesians about the eternal purpose of God and about the objective for the church, what God has intended. He tells the Ephesians, hey, it's not found anywhere else. And the Philippians is the only place he opens up what was involved in Jesus humbling himself and becoming a servant. He opens that up in the second chapter, how he emptied himself and divested himself of all the prerogatives of deity, took upon himself the form of a servant, was humbled. He goes, in, like he never goes into that, no one else goes into it like that. And the Colossians, he shows the absurdity of serving a, a rule-oriented religion when you've been connected with the head in the second chapter of Colossians, and that's not developed fully in any other book. So there were unique teachings. There were things that had to, listen, brother, the church had to know these things to survive, to grow up, to advance in the faith. They had to know these things, but apparently it, they had to, the writer had to be in some form of isolation where there wasn't a lot of interruptions and a lot of things coming in. That's why I went to, went to prison. Of something that Brother Michael brought to our attention, and mine specifically, I hadn't thought about it. That Romans 8 28 it states yeah. that God is working all things together for the good of them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. We have to have the broad view of That's all right. of God's people. That's right. Because Amen. if you look at one individual, say Paul, and consider his circumstances, you may be tempted to think, well, that doesn't look like it was working out for his good. Yeah. He loved God and He was called according yeah. to His purpose, but Look at the repercussions That's of right. why he was there. It's yeah. worked out to a lot of other people. That's right. Good. Amen. 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 And the glory of this thing is that Paul saw this. See? It's one thing to say this and quote Romans 8 28. And we're thankful that anyone that quotes it and says it because we need to hear it. But it's another thing to actually see it yeah. and perceive it. 
sitting in it. Now, they didn't have prisons like they got today with a lot of conveniences and air conditioning. These were like dungeons. And you were in chains while you were in the cell. You were in chains. See, we, we let them loose for humanitarian reasons today. But they didn't then. So in that circumstance, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ looking around this cold, dark, dank cell. <laughs> Dungeon. Yes, yeah, right. Chains on you. Probably, probably a soldier sitting with you you've been chained to. I had this experience in India where I was incarcerated for a season and I was chained, you know. Even though I went to the bathroom, I had to take the soldiers. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of circumstance he's in, but he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And this all worked out, why? Because you, you actually learn more when you suffer. With Jesus, when you suffer with Jesus. There's something about suffering that cuts the cord to the world and makes you more desirous for the things. You've experienced it. You know this already. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. The things that I had to divulge to you Gentiles had to pass through this filter of suffering for me to really make the point and see it as clear. I had to see this thing clearly before I could divulge it. And I couldn't see it clearly until under, I was under these circumstances. Then while the earth began to fade, the values of earth began to fade, the glories of heaven began to open up. Amen. That's the manner of the kingdom. Are you, you'll experience, at your own level, you'll experience this, but you'll find it be pretty consistent. Particularly in recent, you know, we've had three families that passed through the tornado. They came out unscathed, but they also came out with some insights and some perceptions they didn't have before. Amen. And they needed those perceptions. So now there are authorities, these three families are authorities on these and so they divulge them to us and we say, yeah, we, yeah. we can see they're not just philosophizing. This is something they've learned. What was the same with Paul? You've heard of I, Paul. You've heard of me. The prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. That's what happened to me is, is intended to enhance my ministry. If, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, <coughs> now once again it's important to make a note that he, Paul's just not merely defending himself against false charges, saying now, folks shouldn't be criticizing me. I'm bona fide and I'm, I wish they'd just stop it criticizing me the way they do. That's not why he's talking this way. He's confirming the legitimacy of the gospel he's preached. Why would I keep preaching this gospel if when I preached it, I went to jail? I'd say, well, I gotta modify this some. 1964, my mind goes back to 1964. We had six children. There were no such thing as Indiana's home school. It was unlawful against the law. Put you in jail if you schooled your children. And there wasn't any provision to do it anyway. And the government ruled you can't pray in school. So yeah, the law came down. Everybody was told. You can't pray in school. You can't pray publicly. So the kids came home. Some of them were teenagers. They said, what do we do? I said, stand up on the desk and pray. We're not stopping. We're not going to stop. Doesn't make any difference who said stop. But most of the church 
stopped. And commencing with that time, there has been a deterioration and a decline in the church that has not yet stopped. But yes, but I'm showing you here, <clears throat> is that a person who really sees the gospel, you cannot stop their mouth. Yes. Doesn't make any difference what you do. You may stone them to death, and their last words will be, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> In his last prayer, be forgive them, and don't lay not this sin to their charge. Oh, Saul, he never could forget that, could he? You can't stop it. Now, Paul substantiated this by saying, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, see, I kept on, I wrote it down. I sent it out. I, I found a way to send it. How do, you, how do you send a letter out of prison? <laughs> how exactly do you do that? Well, Paul figured out a way to do it. God showed him how. God probably sent some visitors like Onesimus, uh -huh. some of those who says, hey, like Paul, you got any letters you'd like me to just hand them here to me and I'll deliver them for you. Amen. They got out. Uh -huh. Couldn't stop it. Do you know that most of the denominational factions and dis religious disagreements are over what Paul said? Yeah. Almost all of them. They're over what Paul said. Things like election, predestination, the grace of God, the futility of works, the danger of falling away, the purpose of the church, spiritual gifts, the Lord's Supper, baptism, so forth. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're all things Paul taught. Well, what if he hadn't taught them? Well, I'm glad he did. Yes, I, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. For you Gentiles, there's things you Gentiles have to know. And I got to be undistracted when I send them. Yeah. Though I'm in prison for that. You've probably heard of this dispensation of grace I've got. Surely you've heard. Some verses say, surely you've heard. I'm assuming you've heard. Some versions say, or certainly you've heard. I don't know it teaches you that the churches did do some talking with one another yeah. in, the, in the early century. There was a man with a consistent message and people talked. Well, that Paul, he, you heard about what Paul preaches, don't you? Some people misrepresented what he preached, but there was a lot of talking that was going on among the churches. If you were to take an average church member in our city and say, well, what, what does your preacher preach about the grace of God? Well, they'd probably be, well, you know, I don't know. We don't, we don't hear much about that. Some people might be able to tell you something, but I'm, what I'm showing you here is Paul was noted for what he preached, and professional preachers today, famous preachers today, are not noted for what they preach. They're noted for their administrative skills or the campuses they build or their involvement in the community affairs and society. Very few are actually noted for what they speak or preach. In fact, I really don't know of anybody personally outside my personal acquaintances that I that they are known for what they preach. But Paul was. You've heard. You've heard, haven't you? About the dispensation of the grace of God. You've heard about the dispensation. Think of dispensing. The dispensation of the grace of God has been given to me. That Paul had confidence in what he did preach. That's so right. He knew what he had said, yeah. and he knew that it had power, and yeah. that it had pro proliferated throughout the community. And but well, if he didn't have that, if he yeah. didn't, 
have that kind of trust in the word itself, he wouldn't have been able to reason like The power is in the word. Yeah. yeah. So the fact the fact that a, someone disagrees with what you said doesn't have anything to do with it. The power is still in the message of the gospel, still has its power whether anyone agrees with it or not. Yeah, it may work and work and work and pretty soon Jesus says, Well, that's enough for Saul of Tarsus now. He's thought long enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna intrude now. I'm gonna rough. I'm gonna I'm gonna override his free will. Poof, I'm gonna come right into his life. Because he's ready now, he's been kicking kicking against the goats. He's been having some trouble with this, so now's the time. But if a message hadn't been preached, this wouldn't have been true. Now let's look at this dispensation of the grace of God. What exactly is a dispensation of the grace of God? Now I want to make a, a brief point here about the Greek language. The Koine Greek, which is the type of Greek that the Bible's written in, if the Koine Greek was very precise and very exact as the perpetrators of respect for the Greek language say, you see, it's very precise and very exact. If that's true, how come the experts in the Greek language who translate the Bible can't agree on what it says? I'm going to give you some examples of the different translations. In other words, read the stewardship of God's grace, the administration of God's grace, the commission of God's grace, the ordering of God's grace, the work of God's, of God in his grace God has given me to do, how God gave me the responsibility, the way in which God entrusted me with the grace, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace, this special work of showing God's favor, the plan of God's gracious love, the responsibility of administering God's grace. God's favor has been entrusted to me and the stewardship of God's grace, his unmerited favor, Amplified Bible. Now, these are different translations, but they don't, listen, they don't all say the same thing. But if it was true that the Greek language was very precise and there was no question about what it meant, and if he'd use the verb endings correctly and the tenses correctly, you would positively know what it meant, then how come these versions differ? And I call upon the fans of the Greek to explain that to us all. Does that make sense? If you all had the same English dictionary and we looked up a word and you had the same dictionary Everybody come to the same conclusion about what the thing said, what it meant. What I'm saying here is that the core message of the gospel has got to be merged with enlightenment from heaven. Amen. Otherwise, it's a, it's a pointless message. Then Paul is speaking about his core message, the message from which everything else all right, now under the law, the core message was, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, not the gospel. Right. Not, not, not the gospel. The sin of the gospel is not that you love God, it's that God loves you. <laughs> completely different. It's completely different. The core message, every bit of Paul's teaching, it didn't spring out of you ought to love God, therefore, a lot of preaching does now. I understand that. But that's not, he built on the core message that Christ died addressing the matter of sin. He was buried, addressing the matter of death. And he rose from the dead, triumphant over all that kept man from God. 
That's the core message. Every bit of teaching radiates out from that. If he tells you to put on the whole armor of God, it radiates out from that core message. If he, if he tells you to do good to all men, especially those in the household of faith, it radiates out from that message. So it's the core message, what he's talking about. Now, when God got ready to give the message of the law, he had to give it to a trustworthy person. So he gave it to Moses. He said of Moses, he was faithful in all my house. So Moses wrote down everything God had said in what we call the ordinances, ceremonial law. Everything he wrote down was precise and accurate. He passed it on to the people, what God said. God got ready to speak more extensively about the Messiah. And first he he had to establish that God is going to save men by a man. So he, he first of all divulged that to Abraham in an embryo form. And Abraham was faithfully. Then he leaked out certain aspects of this to the prophets. And the prophets passed it on. So I'm showing you now that, that whatever the message is, whoever is given to has to be faithful to pass it on so God selects who he gives this message to and everybody else is going to get it second hand see you'll never get the gospel anyway but second hand you'll get it from someone who else if you get it, say, I got it right from the Bible well that's second hand holy man of God wrote his spank there moved by the Holy Spirit so God first gave it to a faithful person who passed it on and guaranteed the rest of the people would get the message. Now when it came to the mysteries of the gospel, the faithful man is Paul. And he tells us that God counted him faithful, putting him in the ministry. That's in First Peter, First Timothy. Counted me faithful putting me in the ministry why so I could divulge it isn't just that God wanted to find someone to tell this to and that was it he wanted all of his people to know this but he didn't like it divulge the original message to a 50 different people you can see what kind of jeopardy that would be he did it to one man this the things that Paul divulged he put him in prison so he'd be able to concentrate on this and he made me he was a dispensation of grace he, in other words he gave me he took his grace and because it was too potent to pour out directly on people it was it was too potent he divulged a measure of it to Paul because he knew he could trust Paul to tell it and Paul did. Tell it, he did. I, he affirms that the thing he consistently preached, he didn't obtain by study. Although he was a prodigious student. Yeah. Paul, I imagine Paul, you talk anything about Moses and the prophets, he could tell you what it was. He knew. From a youth up. But that isn't how he come at this dispensation he's talking about this is a dispensation of grace that is it wasn't like that Paul was like uniquely qualified to do this although he did prove to be but the great he was what he was by the grace of God the grace of God made him what he was in other words God wouldn't cast his pearls to the swine anymore than he tells you to so here's this pearl <laughs> of eternal purpose and he doesn't like throw it out there in the public. Yeah. Oh no, he gives it to one of his flock who's who's particularly devoted to him. Yeah. Amen. That's a dispensation of grace. It's an aspect of grace contained in a message or a word. 
Paul said of the Lord Jesus, this is from the Amplified Bible, He judged me and counted me faithful and trustworthy, appointing me to this stewardship of the ministry. I know some people who have seen some very wonderful things, but they've been afraid to tell them. They won't tell them. So what happens after a while, they fade away. Now, if you have a moment of insight when something like comes to you, you know, it just all of a sudden it just it makes sense. You see it. Find somebody to tell it to. That's the secret to keeping it. If you sit on it and you don't speak about it, eventually you'll forget about it. Why is this so? Because God always gives so that the flock. See, he has the churches where he's going to make his habitation. He doesn't make his habitation in a person. He makes it in the church. So whatever he gives a person is intended for the church. Amen. I mean, it all makes perfect sense. Critical issues are the, one of the greatest benefits that I think that that um, the Lord's given us in this place is the, the that there's made a place for expression. Yeah. That, that that it's not just. I mean, I've been in a lot of places where no one ever said anything, but even if they wanted to, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just one man, and he yeah. said everything, and everyone else was supposed to be quiet. And even if there mm -hmm. was a time of expression, it was taken away because. But, but but this is critical, what you just said. I know in myself that I thought I understood it greater than I did until I said it. When I said it, it clarified my own understanding of it, yeah. one, and it, it, uh, it, it was other brethren were able to open it up and expand it greater than I ever could have. Yeah, yeah sometimes who you tell it to see, see it more clearly than you did. That's why some parents, their children will rock it beyond them, see. It wasn't because they were ignorant, it's just the way it works. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. This is for um, verse 16, it, it speaks of that the body working together works effectually. Effectually. Yes. Effectually working to make it increase. That's right. Amen. So there's things like that that's going to cause us all to increase. That's right. Yes. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then pretty soon you have springs of living water. Huh? It may start out a spring. <laughs> a person is springs. <laughs> Amen. 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 Now, for example, Paul didn't declare these matters to all the churches. Not because he didn't want to. The Lord knows he had the care of the churches that came on him Daily he had this burden for people to see what he saw. But to some churches like Corinth and Galatia, most of the teaching was corrective. They were in such a bad shape, it's mostly corrective. But for those that were excelling, he would bring it to him, give him, give him some more. Thank you, honey. So this we have in Paul is telling us that God was in fact reaching out to the Gentiles. That's, that's what was happening here. Now he promised this through the prophets. He said he lift up his hand to the Gentiles. And lift up his hand meant like this. Lift it up like this. <laughs> Come. Isaiah said, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles. I'll do it. How would he do this? In prophesying of the coming to the Jews, the prophets foretold that a special messenger would be sent to prepare the way of the Lord, which would turn out to be John the Baptist. But what are the means through which he would lift up his hand to the Gentiles? He doesn't tell you how. The prophets just tell you this is going to come and the Gentiles will come, but he, do, he never tells you how. He says, they'll come, let us go up to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, you know, and, but he doesn't tell you how. Paul is telling you how. 
was through this apostle to the Gentiles, like John the Baptist is raised up for the Jews, Paul's raised up for the Gentiles. Not just to get them in, but to see to it that they advanced and grew. <laughs> Even though the gospel was, a, initially the gospel was preached to the Gentiles by Peter. Peter makes mention of it in Acts 15, 7, that God made choice among us, which was Peter, and he sent to the house of Cornelius, who was the Gentiles. But the primary ministry to the Gentiles was given to Paul, even though Paul also preached to the Jews like he was told to do in the Lord's commission to him. So you preach to the Gentiles and to my people. Therefore, he referred to himself as the apostle of the Gentiles, a teacher of the Gentiles, an apostle and teacher of the Gentiles. See, by strict definition, an apostle is a delegate with a message. Some people use, refer to themselves as apostles today, some churches. Apostle so-and-so. But that's like an authoritative title. But here, this apostle is not authoritative title. It's a, it's a messenger. It's someone with a message sent by somebody else with a message. The apostles, and in this text particularly Paul, were not primarily authoritarians to determine do this, don't do that. Their power and authority is primarily in their words. And the signs of an apostle was to confirm that the words they said Amen. were genuine. So now that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God, the means of delivering the truth to the people is through the revelation that's been given to his apostles. Now if you were to ask an average preacher, what, what should you preach? They say, preach the word of God preach the scriptures, and this is, we have no contention with this. This is true. But we really want to get right down to it. The preaching has got to be what you've seen. God shows it to you so you can say it. Now see how even in our assembly here, there are different brethren that are being given to see certain Things. Brother Mike has been given to see some things about Babylon. Brother Ricky he sees some things about 1 John and Colossians. Brother Gene has seen some things about Isaiah and Psalms. Brother Robert, he's seen things about 1 Thessalonians and about the words of Jesus. Brother Aaron sees some things about Hebrews. Brother Jeremy's seeing some things about Romans. But what do they do with those things they've seen? They preach them. <laughs> That's how the kingdom works. Amen. Everybody tell what you've seen. If you haven't seen much, don't say much. If you've seen a lot, say a lot. Yeah. Proclaim it. Uh, for Paul, he was on the Isle of Pet. He was uh, in prison. Jesus sent him there. For you Gentiles, he says, to you word. That is, his ministry was pointed toward the Gentiles. To you, it was toward you. It wasn't toward angels. It wasn't toward kings. It was toward you Gentiles. Tailored for you. Some versions say, for your benefit. The word you would indicate where the messenger has been pointed and to whom the word has been delivered. Now, Paul, he'd go into a city, he'd go to a synagogue, he'd preach. Generally, the Jews rejected him. But almost always, there was a company of Gentiles there that accepted him, and his ministry would be toward them. Now, just tell me, frankly, when you hear someone preach, anybody, anybody preach, and they're preaching the good things of God, isn't it refreshing to think it's toward you? <laughs> Paul knows it will be to the Ephesians too. Once they see, look, I'm saying I'm not saying these things to browbeat you. I'm 
is towards you. These are good things I'm talking about, what God's determined to do. And, and he's determined to do it to you. So we've been introduced, therefore, in these first two verses of the third chapter to a man who's in, who has been apprehended by Christ. <laughs> and he recognized that he was where he was by the grace of God, just, just like he was, he was what he was by the grace of God. He was where he was by the grace of God, too. Grace of God put him there to make it more conducive to deliver this message. If your message is talking about eternity and an eternal purpose and what God's going to do in the end, and that's what your message is about, Obviously, it's an advantage when you're in a place that's uncomfortable in this world. It, it lends itself to a more robust message about the world to come, see? I think I'll close there. And if you have anything you'd like to add, we've all been pretty quiet tonight. Yeah, it's kind of like a qualifier in the kingdom of God, whether or not if, if what you've seen, is it worth going through suffering to say it? <laughs> I mean, if it's not, then really, you know, if, if, it, if it's a Joel yeah. Osteen kind of event to where you're really saying it just to make the people smile and be happy, yeah. I mean, it, is it really? Would the man go through it if they said, all right, tomorrow we're taking all your money away and you got to go to prison, would he still say it? See, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, it's a qualifier. Yeah. It's a question. Now, yeah. I'm not... I'm not, um, well, I think it just pretty well stands like it is. Yes, it does. Yes, Sister Tasha. I've been <clears throat> thinking as you've been going through the lesson tonight that uh, Paul wouldn't have been able to accomplish these things if God had not called him. That's right. And because uh, yeah. he would have continued, he would have continued down the road that he was, he was traveling because he was convinced that it was of the Lord. But the Lord was able to to reserve him for Himself and to sanctify him and to, to reveal to him the true the true things of the Lord. And then mm -hmm. the, this is a fruit of God calling Paul and reserving Amen. him for Himself. Amen. Amen. I know my in my own case, I've I, I've not been in through my lifetime accustomed to being ill or infirm ever. Like I went 15 years and never missed a day of work because I was sick. You know, I, I just am not accustomed to it. But during this time, I've detected that I'm seeing some things I've never seen before. So in my personal prayers to God, I tell him, I would like to feel well. I would like not to hurt. I would like to feel just comfortable. But if that means I won't see any more, then I'll take the pain. Mm -hmm. Now, every person has to kind of think on their own level, but everyone will have to make that kind of a decision to maintain your position with the Lord. But uh, it's, a, it's a great comfort to be among a group of people that help you make the, make the right choice. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? Yes, Sister Barb. Your comment about Paul's dissecting the message of the gospel yeah, made me think that that's why the same gospel that wins us to Christ keeps us. Yeah, that's uh -huh. right. Because it's so full yes. that we can continue to dive into it. That's and right. it'll go deeper, mm -hmm. it'll get more substantial, more nourishing. Mm. And all of these things are, are yet to be had. There is still yet more for anyone traversing with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Good insight, Sister. All right, we'll have a word of prayer.